to lead regional economic development through generating jobs and investment, promoting our brand and image globally, as we all know, Lynchburg is the place to be, cultivating talent and enhancing the business climate. Before we get started, two things that are really important. Mayor Jimmy Bryant used to say that it's a great day to be alive in Lynchburg, and it absolutely is. And it's also a great de de a day to be alive in the United States of America. So if we could start with the Pledge of Allegiance, I will ask you to stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will also ask you to extinguish or to cut your cell phones off. Extinguishing your cell phones, that's, maybe we shouldn't destroy them. Although most of us who are living a 24-7 lifestyle would say we should extinguish the cell phone. So if you could take care of that housekeeping, that would be great. This is a unique forum in the sense that there will be four candidates on the stage, two from the 6th Congressional District of Virginia and two from the 5th. While there will be contrary positions taken tonight, this is not a debate in the sense that we do not have two candidates pitted against each other. The Lynchburg Regional Business Alliance's 800 members are dispersed all around the region, some in the 6th and some in the 5th. From the Alliance's perspective, we have two representatives in Congress. As such, it was important to expose our membership to all four candidates and their positions on the issues that impact our membership. Representing the 5th Congressional District, we have Mrs. Leslie Cockburn. Coburn. Co oh, Coburn. My apologies. My apologies. And Mr. Denver Riggleman. And in the 6th Congressional District, we have Mrs. Jennifer Lewis and Delegate Ben Klein. On behalf of the Lynchburg Regional Business Alliance, we are pleased to host this forum with our media partner, ABC 13 WSET. We also extend our appreciation to our legislative series sponsors, Appalachian Power, BB&T, Liberty University, and the News in Advance. Our moderator for this evening is Mr. Mark Spain of ABC 13 WSET. Mark, I will now hand it over to you. All right, thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. All right. Are you ready for a lively discussion? Yeah. All right. And you can participate as well. The format for tonight is as follows. We will begin with a three-minute opening by each of the candidates. Then we will begin our first segment. I will ask business-centric questions to all four candidates. This first group of questions was developed by the Lynchburg Regional Business Alliance Committee on Legislative Affairs. The order of the questions was determined by the level of importance to Alliance Board and Legislative Affairs Committee members. These questions were provided to all four campaigns in advance of this event. Each organization also received a copy of the Lynchburg Regional Business Alliance 2018 Federal Agenda. Candidates will have one minute to provide a response. If desired, each candidate is allowed two 45-second replies which may be used at their discretion. We thank you, the audience, for attending tonight's forum and respectfully request that there not be any interruption of the candidates. We will remove members of the audience who do not follow these guidelines. I'm sure that none of you want to be on the news at 11 o'clock tonight for that. Uh, that probably wouldn't go over very well for you. Um, however, I'm certain that this is not going to be necessary and we simply ask the audience to afford tonight's participants with appropriate respect by listening carefully. Audience members, you have also received a card to write your business related questions on. If time permits, we will entertain as many of those questions as we can. Earlier, we drew numbers to determine who will begin today's forum and who will start the questions. Are you ready? Oh. Yes, you are ready. Okay. Very good. We need young people involved in this election cycle. The order was determined this way. Ben Klein will go first, Denver Riggleman second, Jennifer Lewis third, and Leslie Coburn fourth. 
Let's start with you, Ben Klein. All right, thank you, Mark, and thanks to the Lynchburg Regional Business Alliance for hosting this evening. I want to thank uh, my opponent for being here, and it's great to be with uh, Mr. Riggleman and Ms. Coburn for uh, this lively discussion of the issues. My name is Ben Klein, and it's been an honor to represent the 24th district in the Virginia House of Delegates. I'm from the Shenandoah Valley. I grew up there. I lived there with my wife and twin six-year-old daughters, six going on 16. Uh, and uh, I'm a small-town attorney with offices in Lexington and Amherst and Harrisonburg, where I prosecuted for a time. And uh, growing up in the Valley, I've learned a lot about the values that are important to the 6th Congressional District. I've learned that a commitment to faith, to family, to community is uh, a critical part of uh, what makes the 6th District so unique and so successful. Uh, Virginia itself is a lesson in success, one of the best places in which to do business, start a business, raise a family. The accolades keep coming for Virginia, and that's due in large part to the work that we do down in Richmond, balancing our budget, keeping taxes low, removing onerous regulations from businesses, making sure that they get to succeed and not uh, get imposed upon by the federal government uh, with more and more regulations and more and more taxes. So working uh, on behalf of not just Rockbridge in the General Assembly, where I'm from, but also Bath, Augusta, and Amherst here in this area, uh, we've had some major accomplishments. Rivers Edge Park was due to the legislation that I introduced to, in cooperation with the, st with the state and local governments. Uh, Sweetbriar faced financial difficulties, and working with Sweetbriar and the state government, we were able to make sure that Sweetbriar continued its record of success in educating uh, young women and now men as well. And, uh, there is now a branch of Central Virginia Community College in the town of Amherst, which serves people uh, in Amherst County and surrounding areas, making sure that they can get the training they need to succeed. That happened because of legislation that I introduced and worked uh, on with Scott Garrett. So my record is one of successfully working for the 6th District, for uh, hard-working men and women and businesses within the 6th District, and if elected to Congress, my record would continue to be on behalf of the people of the 6th District. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Riggleman. Thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. Um, this is pretty amazing, uh, the fact that we do have all four of us up here. Um, you know, me and Ms. Coburn, I think this is our fifth debate. Um, and I actually know Jennifer. Um, you know, we're actually uh, right over the mountain from me. So I do appreciate being here. I think I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to just to get to know me, um, why I'm running, uh, and then what I stand for. So uh, my name is Denver Riggleman. I've been married to my wife for 29 years next week. have three daughters, 26, 24, and 21. Uh, my wife, Christine, is CEO of Silverback Distillery. Um, she's Scottish and Irish. I'm not trying to make any judgment, but um, she actually is doing incredible work there. And um, I'm CEO of a small company called Cyber Safari. I'm still a senior consultant at the Pentagon for electronic warfare and countermeasures. Uh, so in my life, uh, we've had a pretty incredible life. We started our distillery back in 2013 after I had sold my first company in 2012. Uh, my military service was about 11 years. I was United States Air Force Intelligence Officer. I was enlisted and commissioned. So a uh, pretty incredible life. Um, and I'll tell you this, uh, when I sold my company in 2012, uh, we moved back to Nelson County, Virginia. Now. Um, you know, I was born and raised in Manassas, Virginia. My dad lived in Fluvanna and Albemarle. So as a kid, I would go back and forth. So I got to know 29 pretty well. Uh, so coming back home, I wanted to come back near my alma mater, which was Charlotte, which was University of Virginia, uh, where my daughter was born. But we fell in love with Charlottesville because not only did I live there for a couple years, but my dad was an electrician and janitor at the University of Virginia. So we wanted to come back home. So we tried to start our company uh, in 2013 back in Virginia, and I thought it would be pretty easy. I thought with uh, my background in starting in a successful company and selling a company that it would be easy to start a manufacturing job in the state of Virginia, in the great commonwealth that we live in. But I found out pretty quickly that wasn't the case. The regulatory burdens that we faced in just trying to build something, a manufacturing facility of, of chemicals uh, in Virginia specifically, was so onerous and so bad that for four years I tried to fight eight regulatory agencies by myself, not getting involved in politics at all. And the reason I'm sitting here today is something I think a lot of you know, is that sometimes you don't get involved with politics, politics gets involved with you. 
I was never really involved that much in any type of political leanings. I would vote, but I always thought with my background in the military doing work behind the door and starting these companies that you would always have sort of a leg up just using rational behavior. What I found even going to the state house is that you're always going to deal with cronyism. You're always going to deal with people that might be bought off, but you're going to deal with people that really don't want you to succeed at times. So that is why I'm here today. When I did this and finding our regulatory burden and what we did, I wanted to do one thing, and somebody asked me this. I wanted to drag the vampires into the sunlight. I want to make sure that we see the people that have a bad effect in our lives and make sure that government isn't always in our pockets and taking from us. That is why I'm here today. It is really out of anger, and I appreciate you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Lewis? Hi, everybody. So good to see a packed house in the, in the building today. So happy to see so many familiar faces as well. I'm Jennifer Lewis. I'm a mental health worker from Waynesboro, um, where I've been very active in my community for the last 11 to 12 years. Um, I've been um, the chair of the Parks and Rec Board in Waynesboro, the Office on Youth. I'm an elected member to the Headwater Soil and Water Conservation Board, and I've been vice chair of the Waynesboro Democratic Party. Almost all of those things I've had to let go to run for Congress, but that's okay. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about, um, other than I'm running an anti-corruption campaign with a very progressive platform of Medicare for All, raising the minimum wage, and fully funding public education. But what I really wanted to talk to you all today while I have just a few minutes is civility. And that's what I want to bring back um, to politics and to Washington. And while I, I appreciate my opponent being here today, I'm very disappointed in the negative ad that w has been aired um, locally. Um, I was very honored um, to sign the Lexington Civil Discourse Pledge. And this is a great group in Lexington, and I really encourage every community to start one of these groups. It's a nonpartisan group, and they get together like once a month, and they just talk about issues. And they have kind of rules. There's no arguing. There's no winning. Um, you just have a thoughtful discussion on topics. And I attended one of their meetings. And at first, it was really intimidating because I'm talking to people that aren't going to agree with me. And they put me in the hot seat. Um, and like I said, it was pretty intimidating. But at the end, we all ended up becoming friendly with each other because we all understand and respect each other as Americans and as patriots. Um, so I was very honored to sign that pledge um, that day that I would keep things civil and respect my opponent all the time. Um, and I will continue to do that because not only do I live by that pledge, I also live by my grandma pledge. And some of you have already heard my grandma pledge, but for those who haven't, um, my grandmother has passed away. She passed away a couple years ago from cancer. And I behave in a way that um, I would not want my grandma to be embarrassed by anything that I said or did. Um, so I live my life by the grandma pledge. And like I said, I was just disappointed to see that my opponent um, not only put out a negative ad, but a negative ad that was full of lies um, and untruths. And in a time where we uh, are debating what's true or what's not true, I don't think that it's appropriate for um, people who want to represent the 6th District to participate in that behavior because the values of the 6th District is not lies and deception. It's being honest with each other. Thank you all. Thank you. Ms. Coburn. My name is Leslie Coburn. My mic is off. Got it? Go. Okay. Uh, I live in Rappahannock County in the 5th District. I live on a farm. My husband and I have been there for just uh, under 20 years now. Um, my background is investigative journalism. I was an investigative journalist for 35 years. I was a producer at 60 Minutes, covering the world, a correspondent at Frontline, wrote for magazines, wrote books, and uh, covered the world, over 50 countries. I covered six wars, and it's very unusual for someone like me to jump over the fence into politics. The reason why I am here is a response to what has been happening in Washington. Um, is our leadership, I think, is a, a disaster at the moment. I feel that uh, government agencies are being eviscerated, like the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Education, the State Department, and on and on. In our fifth district, we have a congressman who's bowed out of the race who does not represent us. And we need good leadership. 
we need to have accountability in Washington. And with my background, I am uniquely positioned to help with accountability and oversight. I think that um, uh, you should know that of the many stories that I've covered, one that I uh, mention often is there was a time when the National Guard was having to patrol in Baghdad in Humvees with no armor on the bottom. They called them cardboard coffins. And they used to go out to the dump yard outside of Baghdad to find scrap metal to tack on to these cardboard coffins. They then prayed, and it didn't actually work. So we got together. I got together with the guard. We exposed this on 60 Minutes. We all got in trouble for it. We uh, did a huge amount to help getting those vehicles up armored. And recently, uh, in Franklin County, a woman stood up and she said, I am a retired Army colonel. I was in Donald Rumsfeld's office when that story aired, and I know what a big difference it made. This is the kind of difference that we need to make in the 5th District of Virginia. We have a lot of things that need desperate attention. We have people who need health care. We have huge environmental issues. We have women's issues. We have things that are not being addressed, and I really look forward to being able to do that in Washington. Thank you. All right. Thank you, candidates, for your opening remarks. Now it's time to begin the questions. After I provide the question, the same order as the opening marks, remarks will be used to provide a reply. And that is Ben Klein, Denver Riddleman, Jennifer Lewis, and Leslie Coburn. The first question regarding health care, which is still a topic for debate, a big topic for debate in Congress, specifically related to the Affordable Care Act. The Alliance has an ag agenda which calls for all reforms to incorporate bipartisan input as a focus on reducing costs, access for all Americans, and coverage stability. How would you broach this issue if you make it to Congress? Healthcare is an important issue, one of the top issues for constituents in the 6th Congressional District. And there are some real differences between my opponent and myself on the issue of health care. Quite frankly, the ad I'm running right now simply talks about my opponent's position on this Medicare for All bill, which would result in a doubling of our tax bills on individuals and a doubling of our tax bills on businesses. And since this is a business forum, I think it's important for the business community to understand exactly what Medicare for All entails. My opponent calls herself a bold progressive, so I would have thought that she would be uh, very excited to talk about Medicare for All. I want to commend her for being so en enthusiastic about such a liberal, liberal policy and not trying to run away from it like other Democrats do. All right, thank you. Denver Riddleman. Thank you. That's fast. Um, I think all of us here have talked about uh, we have to come to some kind of meeting of the minds, and I think it is bipartisan. We've talked about no Obamacare, no Trump car care, but, but bipartisan care. Some things that I'm for, since we've got to go pretty fast here. No, number one, HSAs. I think we need to have not only transferable, transferable HSAs, but also unlimited caps on HSAs we can transfer between families. I also believe we need to have portability of health care. I think that's something that's very, very important as we go forward. I don't think we want to lose some of the basic protections that we have in the ACA, which really is pre-existing conditions and also being able to um, actually have your children covered till the age of 26. But I also believe that we need transparency. There's a holy alliance between actually the health care companies and also the government. And without transparency in health care and without employers and employees being able to see that health care and being able to see the cost of each thing that they have when they're actually trying to pick those things, I think that's a foul. And it's one of the things that we have to do in life is we have to make sure that there's transparency and we have to make sure on every single thing we do that we still have competition in the marketplace. Ms. Lewis? Thank you. Um, so I do support Medicare for All. Um, and a couple of things that I want to point out. We fund that by closing corporate loopholes, by ending corporate welfare, um, and just so people know, we already pay for everybody to have health care. When someone shows up in an emergency room, they have to treat that person. And spending money on somebody when they get to that level, 
is more expensive than doing it in a preventive way. And my opponent voted repeatedly against expansion of Medicaid, which would affect 30,000 people in the 6th District. So we need Medicare for all, and I believe that it's a human right. And I believe that because I'm traveling up and down the 6th District, and 99% of the people that I talk to, health care is their number one issue. So the answer is not taking away their health care, it's providing more health care. The opioid addiction issue in this district is rampant, and we need to address it. And one of the ways is fully funding health care and including mental health and uh, addiction services. Uh, Ms. Tober. Uh, I support restoring the subsidies to insurance companies so that the Affordable Care Act will actually work, restoring the individual mandate, stopping the age tax that will be caused if we do not restore these things because older Americans will have to pay five times as much as a younger, healthier person for their uh, health care. I also support going one step further, which is putting Medicare on the exchange. Because the overhead is so much cheaper than, um, than uh, the uh, insurance companies by a huge margin, 2% versus 19, it will be a much more reasonable choice for people. And I also will fight beyond this, and this is going to be a long fight for Medicare for all. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Klein would like to use one of his two rebuttals. I would. Thank you. Uh, the ACA inserted government between uh, residents in there and their health care providers. Uh, doubling down on that is not the right solution. What the right solution is is to open up the marketplace and actually incur encourage competition in the marketplace. I've introduced legislation to actually allow people to buy insurance across state lines. That's something that needs to happen in the federal government so that folks here in Virginia, if they don't have a provider, can go outside of the state to actually purchase insurance at a more affordable level. I'm providing real solutions. My opponent is just providing more and more government. Okay. Ms. Lewis? I'm a mental health worker, and every day I see the numerous cracks that the most vulnerable people in our community fall through. Medicare single stream is the best way to solve those problems. And I really appreciate that to bring up government and our business because you were the one that authored the bill for the, ultra, the invasive ultrasound. So when you talk about government in our lives, does it only impact women? Mr. Riggleman. Ms. Coburn, any response? Remember, you have two opportunities for a rebuttal if you want. Can we take it later? You, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you have two that you can use at any point. Okay. Uh, the Lynchburg region is home to quality colleges and universities. As such, the Alliance believes higher education is a priority. In the federal agenda, the Alliance provides a variety of policy positions as it relates to higher education including supporting continuing support of the core student aid programs. Now, one of these programs the administration is seeking to modify is called the Borrower's Defense to Repayment. What policy positions will you, as a member of Congress, advocate for within the area of higher education? And what changes to these kinds of programs would you support, if any? Mr. Klein. Well, I've been a strong advocate for higher education in the General Assembly. I've sponsored legislation to create an online degree program where uh, for around $18,000 you can get a bachelor's degree by taking a lot of your courses online. I've also helped create a transfer grant program where uh, community college students can transfer to a four-year college and not incur a large amount of debt. At the federal level, I would also seek to make it possible for students to renegotiate uh, their student loan payments. I think that's a, a big problem where folks get trapped in high interest rate loans and can't renegotiate. Just like you'd refinance your mortgage, you should be able to refinance your student loan debt. That's what I'd fight for. Mr. Wiggum. Uh, for me, um, I actually went uh, to the University of Virginia on student loans, and what I had to do was go through a Perkins loan program. I think right now we have such accessibility through the federal government with every type of thing that you need, you automatically get that money. I think there needs to be shared responsibility among the programs. Through the Perkins loan, it's actually shared amongst the federal government and also with the school. I think if we brought everything through the Perkins loan program, I think we're going to have more accountability. I think you're going to help students with debt. 
but I think we can still use this in sort of a free market way where they still have access to loans, but they also make sure we have shared responsibility with the schools so that we can ensure that the federal government is responsible for every single loan that we're doing. Also, as far as trade schools, I think that trade schools, anything with technical training, we need to have the same access and the same loan programs for technical training also. Because looking at the 5th District specifically, we are shorted jobs right now in the labor market based on the fact that we don't have the people to fill those jobs in the 5th District. Ms. Lewis? I support free community college, but also focusing on career um, vocational opportunities as well. So we're doing a school tour right now, and I'm really excited to see a lot of our district schools already have those opportunities in our schools. So kids are already getting the training to either go on to college, a vocational training, or right into the job market, which I think is really exciting. Because for far too long, we focused on everybody needs to go to college and end up in a lot of debt. And now we're seeing a shortage of plumbers, electricians, car mechanics. So we need to make sure that we're respecting those jobs, which are really good jobs, to make sure that people that want to enter those fields have the opportunity as well. Um, and I think, I don't know if we'll talk this about this later, but I do support um, honoring the, um, that you can forgive student loans um, if you go into public service. And I also want to make sure that we are holding schools accountable, these for-profit schools that um, scam students into signing up for their, and they never get a, a um, legitimate degree. We need to make sure that those schools are held accountable. Ms. Kilburn. Your question was about students that have been defrauded by online institutions like the Corinthian Colleges. I support, uh, right now those students are facing a situation where initially in the Obama administration, they were getting the payments they needed back from, those, uh, from that fraud. Now Betsy DeVos is making it much more difficult for those students to get those payments. I do not support her approach on this. I think that those institutions that defraud college students need to be held accountable. And right now in, in the House, this is going to take too long for this amount of time, but there are two contradictory bills, one Republican, one Democrat. The Republican bill wants to uh, give more money to online institutions and less money to students and the, and the Democrats the other way around. So I support the Democratic bill. All right, thank you. And, and, and just, so, just so the candidates and the audience are clear, we had nothing to do with these questions. These questions come from the Alliance, okay? I did not write them, the Alliance did, just to be clear about that. Um, the Lynchburg Regional Business Alliance supports comprehensive tax reforms that work to strengthen the economy, create jobs, and promote investment. What tax policies would you, as an elected representative of the people, propose and advocate for if elected, Mr. Klein. Well, I'm pleased that uh, Congress has taken action to at least temporarily reduce taxes for individuals and for businesses, reduce our corporate income tax, which was among the nation's highest, uh, the world's highest, and uh, I would seek to keep that rate low because it is creating jobs, it is creating economic growth, and uh, we are seeing that in, in record amounts here in this country and in Virginia. So fighting to keep taxes low, um, fighting to remove the tax burdens from businesses that create the jobs, that would be my, where my priority uh, would be in Congress. That's where it's been uh, in Richmond for many years as well. Mr. Wiggleman. For me, um, as far as tax reform is concerned, what we've seen right now, what's pretty incredible, when you look at the job numbers, we have the lowest jobless, jobless claims in 49 years. We have 2.9% unemployment in Virginia, right? We have 4.2% GDP growth. What I've seen in businesses around here, and even in my own business, we've seen this explosion of sort of consumer spending, but also people that are buying stuff from us. I can relate to it personally. What it's allowed us to do is create 20 more jobs with the tax reform that we have right now. So buying more grains from farmers and the things that we've been allowed to do is a direct reflection of the Job Reform, uh, the job reform and Tax Cuts Act. Also, what I find pretty exciting is Opportunity Zones investment. When you look at tax reform specifically, not only it, there's about 20% of the Opportunity Zones from our federal law is actually right here in the 5th District. Not only do you get a tax cut on capital gains if you start a business, 
in these opportunity zones in the fifth district, but you can also invest in those opportunity zones and get those same tax advantages. I find it amazing, not only do we have tax cuts, but we have the ability now to incentivize private investment into the state of Virginia, the Commonwealth, and the fifth district. Ms. Lewis? I do not support the Trump tax cuts that went to the ultra-wealthy. Um, and we see that it's not benefiting people. I'm doing a small business tour where I'm hoping to talk to a small business owner in every precinct in the entire district. We have not met one small business owner who supports these tax cuts. And we are not just blind, we are blindly going to small businesses. We're not targeting them by any means. So when I walk in there, I don't know their political affiliation. These Trump, uh, Trump tax cuts have blown a hole in our deficit. So I support tax reform that supports small businesses and the working class. Thank you. Ms. Coburn? Well, the Trump tax bill added $1.9 trillion to the deficit of the United States. Our grandchildren will be paying for that. This is not something we want to support and I would want to reverse it. 83% of the benefits goes to major corporations and to the very wealthy. And a lot of the middle class are going to be very disappointed when they look at their tax bills next spring. So uh, the, um, this is not something I support, and I really would like to reverse it. That's, that's the main thing. How to do that, uh, there will be a lot of discussion, but uh, really, just adding that amount to the deficit is criminal. You want to use? Go ahead. So because it's a civil discussion, having some fun. So the $1.9 trillion is actually a CBO estimate over 10 years. So right now, um, when you look at CBO estimates, they get very wonky when you get about three or four years outside of that. By the way, tax cuts do not cause deficits. Spending does. So what we want to do is make sure as we increase tax cuts, we want to make sure that we have people like myself who work in federal government and federal contracting who knows the audit trail and knows what to look for when you're looking at wa fraud, waste, and abuse in the federal government. So when we're talking about these type of things, we're talking about tax cuts and spending. We need to be able to separate those and know that tax cuts have spurred this economy to incredible heights but it's spending that we have to get a hold of. Right. Let me, uh, audience, if you would, refrain from applauding until the very end. It'll help move things along, okay? Thank you. Uh, anyone else? There's been much talk of a trade war over the past year with China, specifically related to agriculture and manufacturing, both of which have a major presence in the Lynchburg region. Could each of you inform us of your trade policy? Do you support the President's proposed tariffs on various materials? Mr. Klein. Uh, I am a free trade advocate, and I will be pushing for free trade policies uh, if elected to Congress. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, the President's uh, tariffs are short-term and in pursuit of the long-term goal of lowering overall tariffs globally. So uh, I'm hopeful that we can continue to pursue that goal, and that is the uh, goal that I will take to Washington. Mr. Riddle? Oh, you're going to clap anyway. Hold, hold it down. Thank you. They were clapping for me standing up. Oh, okay. So, so um, <laughs> I think when you're talking about free trade, this is a very difficult question, honestly, for Republicans, especially free trade, you know, pe people that believe in free trade. For me, looking at the, you know, the United States-Mexico-Canada uh, Canada agreement, that was a good first step. But looking at China right now, you're looking, they've lost about $3 trillion in their stock market over the last few months, especially since we've had these rumors of a trade war. Talking to people in the Fifth District, when you look at dairy farmers, when you look at tobacco, when you talk of soybean, it's really a mixed bag, even with timber. So when I, when I talk to all these farmers, some of them are like, listen, we support it, but if it goes too long, we're in trouble. They said, we're okay with short-term pain for long-term gain, but at some point, this tariff might act like a tax. So for me, I think we have to look at each one of these individually, and for me, being in business, I want to look at each one of these individually, but we have to go back to where we have free and fair trade, no matter what we do, especially to make sure that the fifth, the fifth district economy continues to grow. Ms. Lewis. 
I do not support Trump's tariffs, and I don't support any policy that's done without the um, c consultation of experts and that are fired off on Twitter at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we need to be thoughtful about things that we are doing in our, in our government. Um, so I support pro-American worker trade policies. Um, and like I said, I'm doing a small business tour, and I talked to a small business owner. She sells sweet grass to a brewery in Canada. She had to send her shipment off earlier because she was afraid that the tariffs would affect her ability to, to sell to Canada. So it's already hurting small businesses. And I'm a, I'm a, far, a daughter of a farmer, so the last thing I want to see is um, these tariffs impact our farmers who supply us our food and already struggle enough as it is. Ms. Kilburn? Well, the farmers I talk to in the 5th District are very, very unhappy with the tariffs. Uh, from um, a dairy farmer, for example, in Campbell County, uh, who said that it's hurting them very much. Both the fact that Mexico was suddenly no longer buying American cheese to the fact that uh, because of the situation with China, this affects the amount of milk sloshing around in the United States and prices go down. Soybean farmers equally have been very, very upset about this. In fact, I had one soybean farmer in Pennsylvania who was a diehard Republican saying, I am supporting you because you're against the tariffs. I had a draper in Fauquier County whose business will be affected, and indeed a distiller in Nelson County who said that they will be very badly affected as they try to compete internationally. So um, that's their views. Thank you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for sitting on your hands. I appreciate it. Uh, one major concern is regulatory reform. Specifically, the Alliance supports H.R. 10, the Financial Choice Act of 2017, and H.R. 45, the Regulatory Accountability Act of 2017. Can each of you speak to what you would do to ease regulatory burdens across the board? Well, I support both of those bills that uh, the Lynchburg Alliance is pushing, one of which would uh, roll back some of the Dodd-Frank regulations which are putting a stranglehold on uh, our financial services industry, and also legislation uh, related to general regulations uh, which was introduced by Congressman Bob Goodlatte, who's done a fantastic job of fighting to lower regulations. This legislation would ensure uh, transparency through the regulatory process and also consultation uh, with those agencies to make sure that uh, at the end of the day the businesses are thought about instead of just the bureaucrats in Washington. Those are the policies that I would continue to pursue in Washington, uh, carrying on the legacy, the anti-regulation legacy of Congressman Bob Goodlatte. Mr. Riggleman. I think people know me know what I feel about regulations. So uh, as far as H.R. 45 is concerned, it's something that excites me. Um, it's pretty funny when you have uh, bureaucrats and administrators push back because they actually have to use code law to rationalize their regulations to any type of small business or large business that they're actually overseeing. So they push back on that. And what H.R. 45 does is it actually makes people who are making regulations be accountable for the regulations that they make, and it puts Congress back in charge of that type of decision making. I think that's something that we have to support. For me, I know this, when you fight eight regulatory agencies and when you have somebody who's actually sort of affecting you with those regulations and weaponizing those regulations and weaponizing that compliance and they have no idea what you go through or even what that stuff says or what it means, it makes you pretty daggone angry. And I think when you look at H.R. 45 and the way that this, and I wish I could go to, oh, H.R. 10 I'm not going to get to, but I wish going through H.R. 45, we have to make sure that we have accountability for the regulatory state in the country that we're in right now. Ms. Lewis? So we don't need to have unnecessary regulations that hurt small and local regional banks and small businesses. Um, but those um, like small and regional banks don't pose the same risk that these big banks do that led us into the collapse that we saw in 2008. So we need to make sure that we are regulating these big banks, but those big banks like um, J.P. Morgan and, and Goldman Sachs, they should be held to a certain standard, not the, our local and regional banks. And we need to make sure that we're not hampering um, the small businesses ability to grow. Um, but we do need to have regulations in terms of big businesses, big corporations, and big banks, because they hold so much power that they literally can put us into a recession like we saw in 2008. Ms. Gilbert? 
Well, I think both bills would be absolutely disastrous. H.R. 10, I would like to remind everyone what happened in the financial collapse. We, uh, nine million people lost their homes. We paid the banks nearly $17 trillion. That was the bailout, $17 trillion. We need Dodd-Frank, we need those regulations so that we don't get hoodwinked again and are, are being the ones who are ho left holding the bag. We have to stop the banks playing in the casino. H.R. Uh, 10 would re re reverse a lot of Dodd-Frank and it would also remove the teeth of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. That is the only bureau we have that protects consumers. And that's everything from student loans to auto loans. We need these things. And uh, the, the other bill, uh, what it does is it wraps massive amount of red tape around an agency, a government agency. So if you want to go after asbestos or uranium or um, it's red, Time. you cannot do it. The national debt is still a concern to many Americans. It's still growing, furthering the financial burden of future generations. If elected, what cuts to spending would you support to combat this issue? The debt is at an unsustainable level, $20 trillion and counting. We are nearing $1 trillion uh, annually in addition to the debt. So we need to get a hold of that. We all actually need to address our deficit spending, piling on new government programs that may sound good, like Medicare, Medicare for all. Uh, do nothing but add to that deficit, add to that debt. We need to actually get a handle on spending in areas like foreign, foreign aid, where we are overextended around the globe. We need to roll back some of those entanglements and some of that involvement and some of that spending. Uh, that's one area where I would focus uh, to help reduce the deficit and balance the budget, which I have done down in Richmond uh, for several years. Mr. Riggleman. So uh, one of my jobs actually is to dedupe or stop duplication of technical programs for operationalizing policy in the Department of Defense. And what we have to do is we look, have to look at all these programs and these redundant programs and take the money out of those redundant programs. So I started looking at like the top 20, you know, government sort of uh, associations or committees that spent a lot of money that had redundant issues. One of them was like rural electrification from 1935. Another one was an economic development association started in the 1800s. That actually 62 other agencies do redundant work for that specific agency. And that agency spends, I think it's about 900 million over 10 years. So when you start looking at all these agencies with, with redundant issues, you need somebody who's audited these and had to actually look at deduping or stop the duplication of effort among most multiple programs and multiple agencies. I think we need an audit of every single federal, federal agency, and I think we need somebody like myself who's been able to do this at one level to see if we can do it at another level to make sure that all that duplication goes away and we rip that funding out of there and put it to where we need to put it. Um, so the first thing we need to do is, um, in talking about Medicare for All, right now Medicare can't negotiate drug prices. And if we could, that could save us $160 billion over the next 10 years. So that's one way that we can save money. Another way, we need to bring our troops home and stop sending them to costly wars. And then we have the audacity to not fully fund the VA services when they come home, which I do support fully funding the VA as well. Um, but we are, we are having a, a, a debt crisis and the last thing we need to do is be doing these big tax cuts to the ultra wealthy. Again, people need to be paying their fair share. And we need to make sure that um, these big corporations are not able to keep their money in offshore accounts, again, not paying their fair share. Well, you don't solve the debt problem by adding $1.9 to the deficit. That's for starters. We need to reverse that. We need to stop fighting credit card wars. We cannot afford the wars we are engaged in. Right now, uh, Afghanistan is about to hit a trillion dollars cost. And the interest alone on our credit card wars is going to equal seven trillion dollars. So this has to be reined in and gotten under control. Right now, the Air Force has one uh, aircraft that has a toilet seat cover that cost $10,000. That would be a good place to start. Yeah. But we need to 
negotiate with drug companies, that will save. Um, if, you, if, you, if we paid the amount that Europeans pay for drugs, we could save $2.5 trillion. Thank you. And just to let you candidates know, uh, Mr. Klein, you have one rebuttal left. Mr. Riggleman, one. Ms. Lewis, one. Uh, Ms. Coburn, you have both. The Lynchburg Regional Business Alliance supports improving the modernizing of the American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, by honoring existing trade partners with the United States, eliminating the remaining trade distortions and barriers with Canada and Mexico, and raising intellectual property rights and investment standards to levels equal to the United States. What's your position on NAFTA, and what changes would you support, if any? Well, we uh, have a, an administration that has successfully negotiated uh, changes to NAFTA, and so uh, we're well on our way to improving our trade position vis-a-vis -vis Canada and Mexico. Uh, when it comes to intellectual property, uh, China is one of the major offenders when it comes to violations of our intellectual property rights. Uh, Congressman Goodlatte has uh, pursued legislation, and we also need to take a, a strong a firm hand with China when it comes to uh, violations of intellectual property rights uh, as it, when it comes to Americans. So I would support uh, negotiating, renegotiating trade agreements in that area as well. So we did just uh, negotiate the USMCA, United States Mexico Canada Agreement. And some of the things I looked in there when I started to read it, you get a little bit excited for the fifth district, specifically for dairy. Um, there's even people in this room right now that I've talked to concerning dairy and talking to dairy farmers about what they're going through. And it's not just trade, it's also dumping and some of the other things. But it seems like right now, based on the fact that Canada has relaxed those dairy tariffs, for the 5th District, I would love to go there myself and talk to Canada about what we can do back and forth with the 5th District based on the USMCA. You know, Ben stole a little bit of my thunder on China. One of the reasons we have an issue with China is based on technological theft, which is something we have to deal with every day, especially in the DOD. So one of the things, one of the fulcrums that we're trying to use or one of the pressure points is that that has to stop in order to get a trade deal. So when we're talking about some of these things. There's some bigger pictures when you're talking about the USMCA, but also with China and some of the things that they're doing specifically in the Department of Defense arena, but also in, tr in stealing our trade secrets. Anytime we talk about ch changing trade policies or anything like that, we need to keep in mind that we need to be supporting American workers and American jobs. So that's my number one issue, my number one concern when we're talking about trade policies, um, is that we need to make sure that we're protecting our workers, protecting our jobs. So yes, while NAFTA does need to be, need to be changed and reformed because it was signed into to law when our current congressman was finishing his first year um, in Washington, and I think Clinton was president, and um, so yes, things need to be changed after 20 some years, but they don't need to be, uh, negotiations don't need to happen on the backs of um, agreements that are already on the table, like the Paris Accord and the TPP. Well, I think the initial problems with NAFTA were that 700,000 jobs left the United States and uh, went to Mexico. Um, also, 1.3 Mexican farmers were put out of work. Those were small farmers who couldn't compete with the corn that was coming in from the United States. So there were big problems, and I think even our president mentioned those same problems. What's happened now, yes, I agree, this is very good for 5th District dairy farmers. Um, there are other provisions, though, that have been hailed as a big change, like some auto parts have to be made in countries where they pay at least $16 an hour. That's good if it's the United States, but some of those parts are also made in Europe, so that could, be, that could be taken up by parts that are made in Germany for cars that are assembled in Mexico. So we really want to make sure that it's, it's, it involves the United States and not other nations. What is your position on the Atlantic Coast and Mountain Valley pipelines? Well, I'm an all-of-the-above energy policy supporter. So I support oil, I support natural gas, I support coal. Uh, I do support solar and wind, but uh, we have to make sure that whatever the technology, whatever the resource, it is transported safely. 
And so when natural gas is transported by pipeline, uh, we have to make sure that it is done with uh, sufficient protections for water. And so I have made sure by writing to both uh, our state uh, Department of Environmental Quality and FERC to make sure that they use the authority that we have given them to make sure that our water supply is kept safe. And so I will continue to be aggressive in pushing our uh, administrative agencies to protect our water and make sure that our citizens are kept safe. Uh, some people know me on this one. So um, for me, I'm a critical infrastructure expert in the Department of Defense. That's what I do. If anybody wants to talk about it afterward, I'm happy to. Why am I against the ACP and the MVP? The reason is because I, I always err on the side of liberty. I also think that there can be I think there can be agreements on protecting private property and growing critical infrastructure and autonomous infrastructures. Looking at what we have, like H.R. 1689, which was a bipartisan bill by Republicans and Democrats, it made it much more difficult for private companies to take public property through public, or private property through public condemnation just for economic gain. Here's what you got to prove to me. You have to prove that private property trumps the economic development of somebody going through there. You have to prove to me that it's not just a money grab for a company. You have to prove to me that our most cherished right of private property will always be, always be protected. Something near and dear to my heart, um, and if we want to talk about it afterwards, we can because the uh, red light's on. I am president and founder of Friends of Augusta, which is a pipeline opposition group, and I've been on the front lines for the last four years standing up for private property rights and against the abuse of eminent domain. A for-profit corporation should not be able to come in and take your land. My opponent voted to give them that right. Yeah. My opponent voted to give them that right to come in and take your land for a dirty, disastrous pipeline project that's going to devalue your land, is not bringing us the jobs, and not getting us any of the gas. We're not going to benefit from any of this. We are only going to see destruction. And I think it's absurd that we are allowing for this abuse of eminent domain. Um, and when we're talking about jobs, the renewable energy industry employs more people than the fossil fuel industry. So renewable energy is the way to go. I'm opposed to the pipelines. The pipelines do not keep the lights on in Virginia. They are utterly unnecessary. They're going through sustainable farms. They're going through um, sections of the 5th District where um, we have wonderful, thriving businesses. And they're going, pl the plan is that they will go through communities like Union Hill in Buckingham, which is an historic African-American freedman community where there will be a giant compressor station spewing toxic chemicals, um, venting methane, and sounding like a diesel locomotive 24-7. These pipelines will leak as much methane as the equivalent, the greenhouse equivalent of 46 coal fire plants. They will go across a thousand waterways, including the James, and they leak into those waterways. This is not protecting Virginians. All right, that concludes our first section. We will now move into a time of questions submitted by the audience. Again, only questions related to business and economic development will be accepted. Candidates, we ask that you be as direct and concise as possible so that we may ask as many audience questions as possible. 30 seconds to answer, yes. But we're moving, we're moving right along. If you want, could we go a minute and allow them to do that? Yes, okay. We will do that. I, you all can, no doubt. This is the first question, and we'll go in the same order. If minimum wage becomes $15 an hour, how do you propose to offset the cost to businesses where those costs will not be passed down to consumers and the quality of products and or services are not diminished? Well, that's an excellent question. It's based on the idea that uh, when businesses are required by government, once again, uh, inserting government in between a relationship between employer and employee, requiring employers to pay a certain uh, $15 minimum wage that it's going to come at a cost. And is that cost going to be uh, borne out through uh, reduced employment, cutting back on hours, 
uh, not hiring that extra person. Uh, there are lots of different ways that this, that the employer is going to be potentially ha have to deal with an increase in the minimum wage. And uh, so we are seeing the tax cuts that are impacting wages uh, beneficially. We're seeing an increase in wages. It's slow, but it's happening. We need to continue to let it happen uh, and leave it to employers and employees to work out uh, what that wage should be. I think, uh, you know, I own a business, and I think the first question I would ask anybody if they want a federal minimum wage is this. Is that federal minimum wage executed across the entire country? Does it take into account cost of living? Does it take into account everything that a business owner has to do and decisions that a business owner has to make? And I would, I would humbly submit no. It can't take into account any of that based on the economics of each region. One of the things, things that scares me the most, even based on what I try to do, you know, we have about 25 people working for us right now, is how do you balance the wage for that area and how do you still make money and how do you hire more people? I think a federal minimum wage will do a couple things. Number one, it'll increase automation, which takes away jobs. I think the second thing it does, it depresses that specific area based on a government regulation that doesn't take into account anything that actually has metrics or what those people will actually do. Right now, somebody working minimum wage full-time still meets poverty standards. So someone who is busting their tail 40, 50 hours a week still has to go to the Department of Social Services and apply for Medicaid, apply for food stamps, apply for a housing choice voucher. Who pays for that? We all do. So giving somebody a living wage is just that. You let them live without having to rely on extra help. So to think that somebody who is working that hard has to go and apply for assistance when they don't want it, when they're working hard, that is a slap in the face to them. They did a recent study out of Harrisonburg that showed that one person just with no dependents, just to meet their basic needs, needed to make a little over $11 an hour. So that's not being able to save. That's not being able to invest in anything. That's just covering your basic needs. And as someone who has worked so many minimum wage jobs, I can't even begin to tell you about it. It's about time that we had a living wage for everybody. Right. Sit on your hands. Well, the minimum wage in Virginia is $7.25, which is $1.50 less than West Virginia. This is shameful. This is shameful. Um, it is not a living wage, and unfortunately what that means is that so many people I talk to every day are working two jobs or three jobs. I even met a woman who was working four jobs. So um, I think we do need to raise the minimum wage. In terms of how we do it, um, when you talk to small business people in the fifth, a lot of them are concerned. They say, you can't go to 15 because I can't afford it, I will go out of business. One couple from Keysville in Charlotte County, for example, said, I can't go that far. So I said, how far could you go? Could you go to 10 or 11, which is the Walmart standard? They thought they could go to 10. Um, I think we need to move up as quickly as possible so that people can live and eat and find a place to live uh, when pay for it. But I think that uh, we need to do it in a two-step process, I believe. Ms. Lewis. I just wanted to add that um, while we've been answering questions, my opponent has repeatedly said less government, less government. But then his answer for the pipeline was more government. The regulation, the regulatory agencies are going to be in charge of making sure that the pipeline is appropriate and, and is safe and, and our water is safe. Well, so what, I'm not sure which one it is. Um, and also, back to the minimum wage issue, uh, like I said, we're doing a small business tour. A lot of small businesses we talk to, and not all of them, but a lot of them are already paying their workers more than minimum wage because they see that if they pay them more, and oftentimes these small businesses are not able to um, offer insurance, so they know that if they pay them a little more, it'll help with job security and not um, so much staff turnover. Mr. Klein, I'd, yeah. 
so my comments on the pipeline were related to existing authority. I'm encouraging regulatory agencies to use the existing authority. When it comes to the minimum wage question, my opponent just proved my point. Leave it to the employer to decide what's right for their business. Don't have government come in and mandate a $15 wage because you're going to end up with businesses going out of business, as Ms. Coburn said, or businesses failing to hire another employee or having to cut back or not expanding. My opponent did not even answer the question, how is a business supposed to adjust to a $15 minimum wage? She just couldn't answer the question. Yes. Can I use one of my comments? You may. Just, I didn't finish on that conversation from Keysville because I think it's an interesting idea, which is this. If you're a small business and you're engaged in rural counties, like our 21 rural counties in the fifth, if you are revitalizing that county with your business in any p w number of ways, let's treat small businesses the way we treat farmers through the farm bill. Let's help them out. Let's let them pay someone a decent wage, and then let's give them a subsidy for helping out in Keysville and really revitalizing the town. You want to use your, this is your final, okay. So, and it's actually an interesting conversation because I, I run a small business. So I have one question for everybody. Would you rather do business here or in almost heaven, West Virginia? My guess is you'd rather do business here. Why? Because we have a more robust economy. We have less regulations, right? And that's how we move forward. As far as dictating to me the wage that I pay somebody with gov government overreach and then actually using taxpayer money to subsidize me is something I don't want personally. Let me win or lose on my own merits in a free market economy with the God-given rights we were given by the Constitution to do this in the United States of America. Thank you. Oh, you're not listening. Oh. Good. What is your position on recent proposals to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid to bring down the deficit? Why? Well, I oppose any proposal that would cut Social Security, Medicare, or Medicaid benefits. Uh, I think that uh, people who are receiving those benefits uh, are expecting and have be prepared for retirement based on an understanding of what they were going to receive. Uh, when it comes to Medicare, same situation. When it comes to Medicaid, um, again, uh, for those populations that are especially um, uh, in need, whether it's seniors, pregnant women, children, the disabled, those are the uh, folks who receive, are eligible for Medicaid. Uh, those people need to continue to receive uh, the benefits that they are expecting. I have an idea. So. Here's, here's, the, here's what I, so what is Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security is what, 45% of the budget, give or take? If you look at uh, Medicare and Medicaid, what's that, 1.3 trillion? So you're looking at half a billion of that is actually general fund, 800 billion is uh, payroll taxes that all of us pay. So let's do this first. Why don't we look at the fraud, waste, and abuse in the system? What, what is it, between 40 and 70 billion if you look at the estimates? Why don't we look at the actual abuse in the system first and see if we can reallocate and save those programs based on somebody actually looking at the spending portion of this. When you look at that, it's a, it's a massive debt that we have. And if you, if, you talk about, if you talk about all social programs and the net interest, you're talking 70% of the budget, 70%. At some point, I don't think it's cutting Social Security, Medicaid, or Medicare. Why don't we go in there and look at the spending, the fraud, waste, and abuse, and do the real hard work it takes to make sure we save these programs from the very people who are running it? I will never support any cuts to Social Security, Medicaid, or Medicare. As a mental health worker, I often help people apply for these benefits. So somebody who is applying for Social Security disability, um, uh, my clients are typically uh, schizophrenic in their early 20s. So they don't have a lot of work experience, if any. So for somebody who does not have any work experience, their Social Security disability check is $750 a month. Nobody can live off of that. 
So again, they're having to apply for all this extra help, which is just more ways that we're paying in different funding streams. So we need to simplify it and make sure that we're actually increasing our Social Security income for the folks that are on disability and then honoring the Social Security that people have paid into. Um, that's the American way is to honor the things that we promised for workers um, that have already paid into the system. Right now, the House Budget Committee, the Republicans on the House Committee, Republican uh, on the Budget Committee, have proposed cutting Social Security by $4 billion. They've proposed cutting Medicare by over $500 billion, as well as cutting Medicaid by $1.5 trillion. I do not support any cuts to Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security. It is not the way to solve the problems that they created last December by adding $1.9 trillion to the deficit of this country. Another audience member question. How do you reconcile sustained immigration with a push to legislate increased minimum wages? Could deflating our labor market have the same result? If I'm understanding the question correctly, it's it, whether um, decreasing legal immigration levels would have a, an impact on wages and employment in this country. That's um, how I'm, I take it. I'm the son of an economics professor at Washington Lee. I'm not an economics professor. Uh, but I do uh, support immigration. I do support legal immigration. And I do believe we need to reform our legal immigration program so that we ensure that those who come to this country legally uh, have the skills that are needed in this country. And that will uh, hopefully have a positive impact on jobs, on the economy, and on wages. Once the legal uh, immigration system is reformed, uh, we also have to combat illegal immigration and stop it in its tracks. <laughs> 